Um, without further ado, I want to dive into today's word. I'm excited about it. We've been traveling through the book of Hebrews, and we're going to be looking at the middle part of chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be focusing particularly on verses 19 through 25. But as we do, again, I want to lay the context of why we are where we are in this book. And for those of you that have been traveling with us, thank you for allowing me to kind of indulge in setting the stage of the book of Hebrews. But it's important to see that before we get into this section. Because what we're doing now is we're moving toward the applicational piece of what the author is saying. And it's good, it's great to hear, it's good to say, hey, we need to do this and have God do that. But without understanding the background behind it, it's okay, but we really don't have the impetus and the encouragement behind why the author is saying that. So as you know, or several of you know, we've been going through this book, and the whole purpose behind it is that the people of God, most of them were Jews who had become followers of Jesus. So Christ had come, he had lived, he had taught, he had died on a cross, he had risen from the grave, he had proved his resurrection to over 500 people, and then he had, as we see in scriptures, and has ascended into heaven saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you, I will come back. And all of that is exciting, and everybody sees this, and everybody begins to say, we need to follow Jesus. Now, let me help you understand this. For literally thousand of years, probably 1,500 to 1,700 years, the old covenant system had been in place. And that system was that the Levitical priests of the tribe of Levi were the ones who were in charge of caring for either the temple or the tabernacle. And as we travel through the Old Testament, we see a period where there's the temple, the temple is ruined, and then the tabernacle as they're sort of traveling or they're nomadic in sort of their time with God, and then the establishment of the temple again. Now, the temple was important because that's where God dwelt. Just to keep it simple, some of you might have seen again the movie Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, God dwelt in the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God's presence was. We've seen that in that, the temple or the tabernacle was an enclosed space where the people of God could go, but then in sort of the holy place, that was where only the Levitical priests could go. And so let me just kind of again reiterate this. Only the people of God could have access to the inside of the temple or the tabernacle as it should have been. Only the Levitical priests could go into the holy place. And then as we've talked about, there was the holy of holies. Okay? The final place within the temple or the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, okay, the main priest, would go in and make a blood sacrifice in order to essentially, and I'm going to put this in quotes, atone for the sins of God's people. But what we've also learned is that that happened over and over and over and over, and I'm not going to the xylophone because you guys probably remember that, again. And people were kind of saying, well, gosh, what, what's going on here? We're doing this time and time and time again. And really, nothing's going on. So the author of Hebrews is discovering and going back to that time. Because what's happened is the people who follow Jesus now are being persecuted. They're going through a difficult time. Simultaneously, and this is why this is so important, the temple still is in operation. That's so important to remember and recognize. Jesus lived, he most likely uh, ministered from the age of 30 to 32 or 33. He dies on the cross, and the 
temple is not destroyed until 70 AD. So there's this period of time where Jesus has gone up to heaven and said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and the temple is still functioning, and the people who had followed the old covenant way have now begun to follow Jesus, and it's hard. And it isn't what they thought. It isn't all roses. It isn't easy. In fact, because they believe in Jesus, their life is even harder than it was before. And so what's happening is, is they're sitting there going, well, maybe we should go back. Maybe the old way is better. And the whole point in this is for us to think through, are there times in our life when it, we have challenges before God and we might say, you know what? Maybe another way is better. Maybe this Jesus thing isn't as good as it should be. And so the author spends essentially the first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews demonstrating the superiority of Jesus. The best of the best. I've said it before, the goat, the greatest of all times. That's what's going on here. And so he starts to lay down a logical foundation that says, let's look back at the prophets. Now, they were fine. They were good. But how much better is Jesus? Let's look back at Moses. And everybody would know Moses. And they'd be like, yeah, Moses was awesome. And the author says, look at how much better Jesus is than Moses. And then he goes in and he starts talking about the old system and demonstrates how it was defunct how it could not complete what we desperately need. And he says, but Jesus did. One single time through his death and resurrection from the grave. What we read, particularly in chapters 8 and 9 and the start of 10, is this. That all of the Old Testament sacrifice, as it was good, I mean, it was essentially declared by God, was not there to cleanse us and remove us from our sin. It was there to remind us how desperately sinful we are and how desperately we need a Savior. And the author says that what was going on was outwardly, okay, outwardly when the priests would do these sacrifices, we would be, and I'm going to put it in quote, clean. But inwardly, in our conscience, in our souls, we would still be guilty. And so before I dive into this message, I just want to leave you with this. Imagine if today you came to church and I told you, great, you know, awesome, guess what? You're fortunate enough, today is the day of atonement, you came at the right time, we do this once a year, I'm going to go get set, do my thing, and go atone for your sins. Now, first of all, remind you, I have to what? Atone for mine first, and then I can start atoning for yours. And if everything's okay, and I've cleansed myself outwardly enough, and the person who has the rope that's tied around me is smart enough to listen to the bells that are on my wrist, to where if they start hearing this, I'm burning, I'm melting, they realize that something's gone wrong and they can pull me away. And so we do that, and you guys are all excited, and then, guess what? We're driving home today, and somebody cuts you off, and you have a few choice words in your heart toward them, and now you've got to wait a whole other year. That's what's going on here. But let me also tell you this. How many of you are Jewish by race? So let me leave you with this you would be outside of the church right now. You would be out in the parking lot seeing what's going on, wondering what this is all about. Now, if you were fortunate enough to be Jewish, you could be inside, but only the Levitical priests could go into the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest or the main priest could go into the holy, holy place. And then Jesus comes. And he dies on a cross, and he forgives us of our sin. And remember what happens in Scripture? Don't forget this. 
When Jesus says, it is finished, he gives up his spirit. That's a whole other sermon for another day. But what happens? There's an earthquake, and what else? The curtain that separates the holy of holies in the holy place is torn from the top to the bottom, and that's wholly significant. Because what that means is, when Jesus says it is finished, our sins are paid for, but also this old system that is defunct and futile is no longer needed. And the reason that the veil is torn is you no longer need a priest to go forward and access the mercy and grace of God on your behalf. It's yours. Freely and wholly given to us by our great high priest, Jesus, who we've learned isn't part of the Levitical priesthood, is he? He's the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And don't forget that, because the reason that that's special is the priests, as important as they were, were only priests. The kings during this time, as important as they were, were only kings. But priests and kings could not mix. One time in scripture we see it happen. Uzziah tries to essentially, as king, be a priest, and it doesn't go well for him. But Jesus is both priest and king giving him the authority to forgive us of our sins. So we're going to dive into now, as we've seen this, the applicational side. Essentially, why would you go back to this old system when you have all of this in Jesus? But now that you have this in Jesus, what should we do with it? I mean, it's one thing to hear about it and say, great, we have a great high priest. Jesus is the best of the best. He is the goat. But what do we do? How should we live? And that's where we find ourselves today. Again, we're in Hebrews 10. We're looking particularly at verses 19 through 25. And the question we're asking today is this. Now that we know about the superiority of Jesus over the old covenant, what should we do? What's our encouragement? What is the author telling us to do? And so this is what we see. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We get to draw near to God. We're no longer distant. We can draw near to God with confidence. Now think about this. Only the priest could draw near to God. And I guarantee you that when the priest went forward, there was some trepidation in his heart. Am I truly cleansed? Think through this for a minute. Because of what Christ has done for you, for me, by dying on a cross as the great high priest, we now get to draw near to God confidently, not because of ourselves, but because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. The other thing, too, if you're interested in this, verse 19 all the way to 23, start at 23, one big, long, amazing run-on sentence. Probably my favorite run-on sentence of all times. Verse 23. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some in the habit, are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And so as we dive into this passage, this is where we really move toward the applicational aspect of what's going on. Essentially, from this point forward, the author is going to say, now that we know this, now that we've established this, what do we do with it? How are we to live? How are we to move forward? And so the first thing that I want to say, and this is what I've said before in the last three messages, but is absolutely fundamental to understanding what we have in Jesus Christ, is this. To fully appreciate the severity and the seriousness of the gift of mercy and grace given to us through Christ, we must acknowledge the severity and the seriousness of our sin. When we look back to the Old Covenant, it's not that it was bad. What we discover is the holiness of God, the greatness of God. And the fact that God is holy means that anything that is not holy, anything that is not pure, can't be part of him. That's why he was separate yet present among us. And that is why once a year, the high priest would cleanse himself and then move forward to make that sacrifice. And so one of the things that I want to encourage you in is this, that oftentimes we come forward and we think, well, sure, Jesus is a wonderful person. Jesus essentially makes me better. And I've said this before, Jesus did not die to make good people better. He died to make people who are dead in their sins alive. There is no means, there are no means by which we can get to God on our own fruition. Now, I'm not saying that being a good person is bad, but what we must remember and recognize is, is that we don't get to God by doing good things. We get to God by recognizing our brokenness and need for a Savior. After having been saved, realizing that Christ is our Savior, we're encouraged to move forward and do works for God. But it's not through our works that we get to God. So brothers and sisters, those of you that are gathered this morning, I just want to lay that foundation that when we realize the gift of mercy and grace given to us, when we recognize that we are sinners in need of a Savior, when we recognize that we are imperfect people, when we realize that there are no means to get to God in and of ourselves, whether it's by coming to church, although it's not a bad thing, whether it's through our own intellectual pursuit, whether it's through volunteering and doing things at church, all of those are good, but those things don't save us. What saves us is our great high priest, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who went to the cross on our behalf, scorning its shame so that we might have eternal life through his sacrifice. And so in that, we get into verses 19 through 22, and again, it's very applicational. It's let us, let us do this, let us do this, let us do this, because of all of what we've seen in these first 10 chapters. And so the first thing that we see is let us draw near to God with full assurance of our faith. Now think through this for a minute. This is true theologically, but it's also true in the real world application of what was going on with God's people. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Think about this. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Why would that be there? Well, again, as I've said before, for thousands of years, the Holy of Holies was a place that was reserved only for the Levitical priests, and then obviously the holy place was reserved for only one priest who would enter one time a year. You and I wouldn't go anywhere near it. And yet, because of our high priest, Jesus, who died on a cross, not because of ourselves, because of him, we have confidence to enter the holy place. How? Well, for centuries, it was by the blood of bulls and goats. 
But how do we have access to it? By the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. You heard me talk before, it's sometimes that we give sermons and uh, people are kind of like, well, gosh, that seems kind of morbid, the blood of Jesus. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're to celebrate the blood of Jesus Christ because it's by his blood that we have access to God. And we don't just have access, we have full access to God and we can draw to him in confidence. And then I love this, by a new, okay, Verse 20, by a new and living way. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you, circle living, right? Wait a minute. So for centuries, we killed bulls and goats. And then Jesus comes, and he dies, and we see that his blood is there, but it's a new and living way? Right here. Right here. Here is proof of the solidarity of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This new and living way, our Savior who died and has been resurrected from the grave and is now seated at the right hand of the Father and is essentially building a place for you and I. It's living. The other thing that I want to encourage you in is what? The word of God is living and active to those who are in Jesus Christ. It's transformative. It transforms our hearts from death to life. And when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is within us. And we are moved from death to life and we are transformed by the living word. And so sidebar is this, if we want to be alive with Jesus, let's read and know his living word. By a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain, okay, so referent back to the temple, the curtain that separates. Now here's what's interesting. The temple still exists, but the one difference is that the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies has not been restored and it's been torn in two. That's the difference. And the reason that that curtain has been torn in two, we see, is this. The body of Jesus Christ. When we participate in communion today, and P.S., by the way, anybody who has a relationship with Jesus, you're welcome to partake with us. You don't have to be a member of our church to do so. And we talk about the body and the blood of Christ. This is what's going on. You no longer have to stand outside wonder what's going on. You no longer, if you're fortunate enough, get to go into the temple, but don't go into the Holy of Holies at all. All of that is now done, and you have full access to God and the ability to draw near to Him in confidence because of what Christ has done. And so one of the things that I want to encourage you in is this. Because of the superiority of Jesus' work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, there remains no barrier to keep us out of full of fellowship with God. Please don't miss this. There is no barrier that keeps you out of full fellowship with God. We are fully reconciled to him. What a celebration, what a joy. Now, let me tell you this. While there exists no barrier, have you put up your own barrier? Because that's the only barrier that will uh, exist between your fellowship with Christ. That barrier is disbelief. That barrier is self-pride. That barrier is self-salvation. 
And yet, if we tear that barrier down and we know that we need a Savior, there is no more barrier that separates us from drawing near to God. We continue on in in this run-on sentence. It says after this, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, the next sort of part, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. See how that works? So my question to you this morning is this. Are you drawing near to God with a sincere heart? Is your heart sincere before him? Having our hearts sprinkled Okay, notice that this is now moving internally, right? Now, don't take this 100% literally. It's not like they're you know, tearing out your heart and sprinkling it. But what they're talking about is that guilty conscience that still remained in the old covenant system that we would leave and we would still be guilty before God. But here, because of what Christ has done, our hearts are sprinkled to cleanse us from What? the very guilty conscience that we would have been left with year after year after year after year on the Day of Atonement. Because Christ has died once and for all, and we are forgiven and we are saved. We are righteous before God. We are holy in His sight because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. Now, most likely this is a reference to baptism. But also remember, what would the priest do before he would do the sacrifice and after the sacrifice? He would wash his hands, removing the blood from his hands. So literal, but also baptismal in our joy before Jesus Christ. What I want to encourage you in and what I want you to see before we move on to verse 23 is this. This entrance, okay, in verse 19. We have a newly inaugurated by Christ's consecrating work. We're able to enter in because of what Christ has done. And it is living just as God himself is living. And the word of God lives. And those who follow Christ truly live. We have life because of what Christ has done. We are alive because Christ is indeed the living one. Then we continue and we get into verse 23 and it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And essentially what the author is telling us is the next portion of our message today, and that is simply this. Let us hold fast to our faith in Christ without wavering. He's essentially saying, look, I see that you are wavering. I see that you are wondering. I see that some of you are falling away. Now that you know, now that you have this established, let's hold to our faith unwaveringly. Why? Why should we hold on to our faith in an unwavering way? Well, not only do we see the superiority of Jesus, but don't miss this next part in this verse. For he who promised is faithful. So you have all the outward attributes of Jesus. You have all of the things that Christ has done to demonstrate his superiority. But also what we have is Jesus saying, look, this is what I've done, this is what I will do, and I am faithful to do it. And why is that important? Because brothers and sisters in Christ, guess what? We are in a time right now where we have Jesus Christ in our lives if we've placed our faith and trust in him. But are things good? Is everything rosy today? Is our world as wonderful as we hope it would be? Absolutely not. But he who has promised is faithful. And he who has promised has said, you are mine 
I am with you. I have gone to prepare a place for you, and I will come again. He who has promised is faithful. And so in those moments where we wonder and we begin to waver, and we begin to think, is this real? Look back to the superior of Jesus. Recognize who you are in Jesus Christ. And then as you look forward and you await the second coming of Christ, remember that he has promised it and he is faithful. It will come. He is coming again. And then it continues on. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So may we first draw near to God with full assurance of our faith. Let me say it this way. When you fully, truly, authentically have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, okay? When you have said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I need a savior and you are the one who has done it and I'm trusting in you and your work on the cross to bring me out of my sin and make me alive with you. I'm making you Lord of my life, okay? So an authentic thing. It is one and done. And one of the things that I want to encourage you in and the reason that I want to just put emphasis on this is so often what will happen is this. The enemy will see that and he will rile and he will become upset because that's one less that he has for his kingdom. But what he will do, although he has no power of your salvation, is to come forward and cause you to question it or doubt it or think that you have to add to it. It can't be that I am saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It can't be that I've placed my faith and trust in him and it's a one and done and I am his. There has to be more. And so what we do is is in our minds the enemy says, absolutely, there is more. You got to do this or you got to do that or you don't have to do this or you don't have to do that. And we begin to feel guilty and question the assurance of our salvation and the totality of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection from the grave and his full ability to save us 100% by grace through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rest in that sacrifice and rest in the full mercy and grace of God. One of the things that I want to do before we get into verses 24 and 25 is just encourage you this way. Our faith and future in Christ are as sure as the promises of God. We've seen earlier, he who has promised is faithful. Well, guess what? Our faith and our future in him are as sure as those promises. Even more, they are as sure as the God who made the promises. He is faithful. And because he is faithful, we can hold fast to our confession of faith all the way to the time our Heavenly Father chooses to take us home. Hold to your faith in Jesus Christ unwaveringly. It is enough. It is all that is needed. And because of that, we move forward to the next portion. And the author says, okay, now, now, now think of this. These people were following Jesus. They were being persecuted. They were saying, maybe we shouldn't follow him anymore. Does it sound familiar Sometimes when the church gets heated up, sometimes when there's persecution, the first thing to do is the saints disperse. Yet what I'm going to tell you is this, when there is persecution and the people of God hold unwaveringly to their faith, those areas in which persecution exists explode. Because people see individuals following Jesus Christ no matter what the cost. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the promise, for he who has promised is faithful. And now, verse 24 and 25, let us meet and encourage one another in our walk with Jesus Christ. Let's gather together. Let's come together in worship. Let's come together in fellowship. Let's come together and celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And how can we spur one another on toward love and good deeds? I want to just say something. Um, When we come to church, are we encouraging other people? Are, are, Are we making it a mission, right? What would happen if we just kind of, before we came to church, said, okay, I know it's crazy, I know it's busy, but I'm just gonna take some time and pray and I'm gonna look for God to lead me to one or two people today to encourage them in their walk with Jesus. It, it might be just as simple as, hey, you know what? Thank you so much for coming. I know it's a busy time. I know you got kids. I know you probably had to get up early. I know that probably it was crazy, but thanks so much for being here. You're awesome. I'm thinking of you. I'm praying for you. It might be going out to somebody who maybe you know has had a hard time and maybe you know some things are going on and you just go up to them and you put your arm around them and you say, hey, it's so great to see you. Keep moving forward. I'm cheering you on. I'm praying for you. You've got people that care about you. Whatever it might be. What would that look like if we took time to encourage each other? To stir one another on in our walk in faith with Jesus Christ. Chuck Swindoll says it probably better than I do. He says it quite simply. This is what he says. Encouragement is awesome. How many of you like to be encouraged? How many of you like to be encouraged? Right? Everybody likes to be encouraged. It's awesome. Hey, you're doing a great job. Hey, thank you for this. Hey, I saw you do that. Hey, I want to stir you on. And what he says is it actually can change the course of another person's day, week, or life. I don't know about you, but um, sometimes when, when uh, we go to the uh, grocery store or whatever, right, uh, we love to just to try to kind of say hi to the person and encourage them and just say, hey, thanks for you know, doing what you're doing. Because their life essentially is, is beep, beep, beep. You know, that'll be $195,642,000 for a thing of eggs, right? They hear that all day. What if you just go up to them and say, hey, thanks? How are you? What's going on today? Thanks for what you do, okay? So many ways that we can be salt and light to people in our world, and it's so easy, and it costs us nothing. But here's what I want to encourage you in. If we can't do it here, why do we think we could go out there and do it? Let us not give up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more, all the more, as you see the day approaching. What's this day that he's talking about? The second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All the more as you see the day approaching. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. I have no idea when Jesus is coming back. I've said it before, I have no clue. If I told you, you should look at me and say something's wrong. Because nobody knows, except for the Father. But the Father knows, and He is faithful in His promises, and it is coming. What I can tell you is this. We are closer today than we were yesterday. And Lord willing, if Jesus chooses not to return today, we will be closer tomorrow than we are today. But it is going to happen. And so lovingly, what we should not be doing is discouraging one another. We should be encouraging one another. But as each day goes by, we should amp up our encouragement to one another and to the world. We should shine the light, as we've seen in VBS, for Jesus. We've kind of looked at this and we're 
turning now toward the applicational side of the book of Hebrews. We're going to be finishing out or rounding out the last part of chapter 10 next week, and then we're getting into the hall of faith. And that's a beautiful portion where those essentially that have finished the race stand in encouragement, spurring those who are still in the race to keep running and keep moving forward. He's building this to demonstrate the great encouragement that we have, not only in our Savior Jesus Christ, but by those saints who continue to persevere in their walk with their Lord and Savior. Now that we know about the superiority of Jesus over the Old Covenant, what should we do? First and foremost, let us draw near to God with full assurance of our faith. Brothers and sisters, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you are His, you are saved, you are a son or a daughter of the living King, and His kingdom is wholly yours, and you will be welcomed into His kingdom with well done, good, and faithful servant. Let us also hold fast to our, uh, fast to our faith without wavering. Sure, the enemy is going to come forward. Sure, he's going to cause you to doubt. That's exactly what he wants to do. But when he causes you to doubt, my encouragement to you is to go back to the book of Hebrews and say, yes, I doubt, but even though I do, I have an unwavering Savior who is the best of the best, the greatest of all time. Get behind me, Satan, and get out of Jesus' way, not my way. And finally, let us meet and encourage another in our walk with Jesus Christ. I would love to see it. I would love to see the encouragement that I saw last night when everybody was done and everybody was given high fives and everybody was saying, hey, great job. How awesome was it? Because this didn't happen because of me. It didn't happen because of Kelly, although God bless you, you did an awesome job. It happened because of all of us. And so many of you encouraged one another. And we saw God doing amazing things in the hearts and the lives of these little kids. I'll leave you with this. This is kind of the summary of today's message, our take-home truth for the day. The whole aspect the whole point of what's going on in this book is moving right into these verses. And it's simply this, because of God's grace, because of what Jesus has done, because of his sacrifice and the grace that we have in Jesus, let us draw near to God. And so number one, don't be afraid of drawing near to him. But number two, I lovingly ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, are you drawing near to him? Daily? Regularly? Let us draw near to God, holding fast to our faith as we meet and encourage one another in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we just thank you for those that are here. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing and how you're working. But most important, Lord, thank you that we have the best of the best in you. Father, may we never forget it. May we recognize that we don't need anything else. But may we also recognize that we desperately need you. And so in that, Father, I pray for those of us that are in Christ, that that would be an encouragement to us to continue to persevere, that we wouldn't turn to other things or try to add to our faith, but we would allow you to be the one who continues to draw us forward through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, making us holy, cleansing us in who Christ is until the day that you choose to take us home. Father, I pray that if there's anybody out there this morning that doesn't know you, I don't think that they're here by just mere coincidence. Father, I pray that the message that has been preached would just uh, land on their heart, that the seed and the watering that's scattered would uh, grow deep in you. Lord, we trust you to be the one that would grow it. But Father, in that I pray that we would recognize that apart uh, from ourselves, we, we have no ability to get to you. Um, we, we need you desperately. And Father, thank you that Christ came to the cross to die upon it to forgive us of our sins. And so in that, Lord, I pray that people would say, you know, that's true. 
I can't get to you on my own. Father, I've seen what you've done with Jesus, and I've seen Christ's willingness to go to the cross. And I've seen how the cross truly is perfect, and the sacrifice of Jesus is perfect, and I want to be part of that kingdom. And so in that, Lord, I pray that as we've learned through your mercy and your grace, we would trust in you. And Father, if we do, may we also then be assured to know that when we've placed our faith and trust in you, we need do nothing more that we are yours because of what Christ has done. And we are welcome to be part of your family. We're welcome at the banquet feast. We're welcome to partake in the blessings of our Savior. And Father, thank you that we have those promises and that those promises are true. We pray these things in your name, dear Jesus, and we ask it all by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen.